Hi guys, this is Allison from Alley Cat Creations. How are you? Please like, share, and subscribe to my channel if you have yet to do so. And if you get anything from my work, a connect a dot, an epiphany, a mind explosion, all the links are in the description. And of course, if you get anything from the authors and the books that I read, please support the authors and please support the books and buy them if you can. I understand if you can't. I try to get as many free PDFs as possible to spread the knowledge. So if you like to support me in any of those ways, wonderful. And that could just be by like, sharing, subscribing. If you would like to have a piece of artwork in your house or something that heals you or organize stuff, artwork to hang up on the wall, I customize so many things. I draw, I paint, I sculpt. Alley Cat Creations 211 is where you can look at my .com, where you can look at my portfolio. Sorry, it's raining here. Raining, raining. Had a very, very, very long day. Very, very long day. Um, I did a lot of reading. Not really, but lots of downloads. I'm tired and I'm free tonight. Yay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read Blavatsky. Gods, monads, and atoms. I'm excited. I hope you are too. There's so much going on up in here. And it, it's just, I just, it has to sift through. Um, I was going to do other videos. I have a quantum AI and metaphysical pondering to get to. Um, I, want to get back to the hermit's journey it's gonna come guys um things have been a little since my birthday right that threw a lot of things off and that's a good thing for me <laughs> um really good because i celebrate 40 was like really good because i got to spend it with people i loved 41 was incredible because my boyfriend did a lot for me and in just little small incremental ways like I didn't get anything I don't need much I need my bills paid <laughs> but nobody could do that for me right now um I had to buy two tires this morning um one of them was only halfway filling up and I've been having to like put air in it every day and I've been trying to, you know, I'm new here and I don't know where the like good spots are. And I just, just too much. So I had to pay a lot of money out of pocket to get two tires. Like I'm over it, 3D world. Um. So yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I am not trying to eternally freak out, but I'm freaking out a little bit because <laughs> these things are costly, but I need to be safe and I need to get around. So things have been off, trying to keep a schedule. It doesn't seem to be working. I'm just gonna go and be the flow and just let it go. And yes, I, I love my hat. It's raining and I don't want my hair soaked. So that's why it's on and I'm not taking it off. I have hat head. Yes, I'm animated tonight. Gods, monads, and atoms. Some years ago, we remarked that, quote, the esoteric doctrine may well be called the thread doctrine, since, like, sutra, sutra men in the Vedanta, philosophy it passes through and strings together all the ancient philosophical religious systems and reconciles and explains them all end quote 
We say now it does more. It not only reconciles the various and apparently conflicting systems, but it checks the discoveries of modern exact science and shows some of them to be necessarily correct since they are found collaborated in the ancient records. All this will no doubt be regarded as terribly impermanent and disrespectful, a veritable crime of laissez science. Nevertheless, it is a fact. Science is undeniably ultra materialistic in our days, but it finds in one sense its jurisdiction. Nature behaving in acu ever esoterically and being, as the Kabbalah say, in absecondo, I'm totally butchering this other language, whatever it's in, can only be judged by the profane through her appearance. And that appearance is always deceitful on the physical plane. On the other hand, the naturalists refuse to blend physics and metaphysics by the body with its informing soul and spirit, which they prefer ignoring. This is a matter of choice with some, while the minority strive very sensibly to enlarge the domain of physical science by trespassing on the forbidden grounds of metaphysics, so distasteful to some materialists. These scientists are wise in their generation for all their wonderful discoveries will go for nothing and remain forever headless bodies unless they lift the veil of matter and strain their eyes to see beyond. Now that they have studied nature in the length, breadth, and thickness of her physical frame, it is time to remove the skeleton to the second plane and search within the unknown depths for the living and real entity for its substance, the nominum of evanescent matter. All is illusion in third and fourth density. <laughs> just saying. It is only by acting on such lines that some of the truths now called exploded superstitions will be discovered to be facts and relics of ancient knowledge and wisdom. One of such degrading beliefs, in the opinion of the old denying skeptic, is found in the idea that cosmos besides its objective planetary inhabitants, its humanities and other inhabited worlds is full of invisible intelligent existence. The so-called archangels, angels, and spirits of the West, copies of their prototypes, the Daihan Kohans, the Divas, the Pitras of the East are no real beings, but fictions. On this point, materialistic science is inexorable. To support its position, it upsets its own axiomatic law of uniformity in the laws of nature, that of continuity, and all the logical sequence of analogies in the evolution of being. The masses of the profane are asked and made to believe that the accumulated testimony of history, which shows even the atheists of old, such as Epicurus and Democritus, Believing in gods was false, and the philosophers like Socrates and Plato asserting their existence were mistaken enthusiasts and fools. If we hold our opinions merely on historical grounds, on the authority of legions of the most eminent sages, Neoplatonists, mystics of all the ages, from Pythagoras down to the eminent scientists and professors of the present century, who, if they reject gods, Believe in spirits, shall we consider such authorities as weak-minded and foolish as any Roman Catholic peasant who believes in and prays to his once human saint or the archangel Saint Michael? But is there no difference between the belief of the peasant and that of the Western heirs to the Rosicrucians and alchemists, al alchemists, sorry, there's my brain, of the Middle Ages? Is it the Van Helmsmonts and Kunrats and Priscillus's 
and Agrippas from Roger Bacon down to St. Germain, who are all blind enthusiasts, hysterics, or cheats? Or is it the handful of modern skeptics, the leaders of thought, who are struck with the necessity of negation? The latter we opine. It would be a miracle indeed, quite an abnormal fact in the realm of probabilities and logic were that handful of negators to be the sole custodians of truth, while the million strong holds hosts of believers in gods, angels, and spirits in Europe and America alone, namely Greek and Latin Christians, theosophists, spiritualists, mystics, should be no better than deluded fanatics and hallucinated mediums, and often no higher than the victims of deceivers and impostors, however varying in their external presentations and dogmas, beliefs in the hosts of invisible intelligences of various grades have all the same foundation. Truth and error are mixed in all. The exact extent, depth, breadth, and length of the mysteries of nature are to be found only in Eastern esoteric sciences. So vast and so profound are these that hardly a few, a very few of the highest initiates, those whose very existence is known but to a small number of adepts, are capable of assimilating the knowledge, yet it is all there and one by one facts and processes in nature's workshops are permitted to find their way into the exact sciences, while mysterious help is given to rare individuals in unraveling its arcana. It is at the close of the great cycles and the connection with radical development that such events generally take place. We are at the very close of the cycle of 5,000 years of the present Aryan Kali Yuga. And between this time and 1897, there will be a large rent made in the veil of nature and the materialistic science will receive a death blow. Without throwing any discredit upon time honored beliefs in whatever direction, we are for forced to draw a marked line between blind faith evolved by theologies and knowledge due to the independent researches of long generations of adepts between in short faith and philosophy there have been in all ages undeniable learned and good men who have been reared in sectarian beliefs died in their crystallized convictions for Protestants, the Garden of Eden is the primeval point of departure in the drama of humanity and the solemn tragedy on the summit of Calvary, the prelude to the hoped for millennium. For Roman Catholics, Satan is at the foundation of the cosmos, Christ in its center and Antichrist at its apex. For both the hierarchy of being begins and ends within the narrow frames of their hierarchy of being, their respective theologies. One self-created personal God and an Empyrean ringing with the hallelujahs of created angels, the rest false gods, Satan, and fiends. Theo philosophy proceeds on broader lines from the very beginning of eons and time and space in our round and globe the mysteries of nature, at any rate, those which it is lawful for our races to know, were recorded by the pupils of those same now invisible heavenly men in geometrical figures and symbols. The keys there too pass from one generation of wise men to the other. Some of the symbols thus pass from the east to the west were brought there from by Pythagoras, who was not the inventor of his famous triangle. The latter figure, along with the plain cube and circle, are more eloquent and scientific descriptions of the order of evolution of the universe, spiritual and psychic as well as physical, than volumes of descriptive cosmogenies and revealed genesis. The ten points inscribed within that Pythagorean triangle are worth all the theologies and theogenies and Anglo- logic -y. don't know how to say that word jeez louise ever emanated from the theological brain 
For he who interprets them on their very face and in order given will find in these 17 points, the seven mathematical points hidden, the uninterrupted series of the ge genealogies from the first heavenly to the terrestrial man. And as they give the order of being, so they reveal the order in which they were evolved in the cosmos, our earth, and the primordial elements by which the latter was generated, begotten in the invisible depths, and in the womb of the same mother, as it fellow globes, he who will master the mysteries of our earth will have mastered those of all others. Whatever ignorance, pride, or fanaticism may suggest to the contrary, esoteric cosmology can be shown inseparably connected with both philosophy and modern science. The gods of the ancients, the monads from Pythagoras down to Leibniz, and the atoms of the present materialistic schools as borrowed by them from the theories of the old Greek atomists are only a compound unit or a graduated unity like the human frame which begins the begins with the body and ends with the spirit. In the occult sciences, they can be studied separately, but never mastered unless viewed in their mutual correlations during their life cycle and as a universal unity during prialia. Like Le Plouche shows sincerity, but gives a poor idea of the philosophical capacities when declaring his personal views on the monad or the mathematical point. A point, he says, is enough to put all the schools in the world in a combustion. But what need has man to know that point, since the creation of such a small being is beyond his power? A Fourier philosophy acts against probability when from that point which absorbs and disconcerts all her meditations she presumes to pass on to the generation of the world. Philosophy, however, can never have formed its conception of a logical, universal, and absolute deity if it had no mathematical point within the circle to base its speculations upon. It is only the manifested point lost to our senses after its pregenic appearance in the infinitude and incognizability of the circle that made a reconciliation between philosophy and theology possible on condition that the latter should abandon its crude materialistic dogmas. And it is because it has so unwisely rejected the Pythagorean monad and geometrical figures that Christian theology has evolved its self-created human and personal God, the monstrous head from whence flow in two streams, the dogmas of salvation and damnation. This is true that even those clergymen who would be philosophers and who were masons have in their arbitrary interpretations fathered upon the ancient sages the queer idea that the monad represented with them the throne of the omnipotent deity placed in the center of the Empyrean to indicate T-G-A-O-T-U, read the great architect of the universe, a curious explanation, this more Masonic than strictly Pythagorean. It's based off of ontological mathematics, sine and cosine, so the mathematics of frequency and vibratory states. And that's only this reality. The laws of physics and the laws of math are expanding although math is finite here it's going to expand physics and quantum physics are now expanding exponentially new equations are going to have to be made new mathematical theorems will have to be made in the quantum science field we're there we're moving on up but in the here and now, wherever you're vibrating at, if you're still in between three, four, you're, you're working and operating on ontological mathematics, which has a lot to do with the monad and Pythagorean. Nor did the hierogram with a circle or equilateral triangle 
ever mean that the ex exemplification of the unity of the divine essence for this was exemplified by the plane of the ba the boundless circle what in really meant was the triune co-equal nature of the first differentiated substance or the con substantiality of the manifested spirit matter and the universe their son who proceeds from the point the real esoteric logos or the pythagorean monad for the greek monas signifies unity in its primary sense those unable to seize the difference between the monad the universal unit and the monads or the manifested unity as also between the ever hidden and the revealed logos or the word ought never to meddle in philosophy, let alone the esoteric science. It is needless to remind the educated reader of Kant's thesis to demonstrate his second antimony. Those who have read and understood it will see clearly the line we draw between the absolutely ideal universe and the invisible, though manifested cosmos. Our gods and monads are not the elements of extension itself, but only those of the invisible reality, which is the, the basis of the manifested cosmos. Neither esoteric philosophy nor Kant nor Leibniz would ever admit the extension can be composed of simple or unextended parts, but theologian philosophers will not grasp this. The circle and the point which latter retires into the merges with the former after having emanated the first three points and connected them with lines, thus forming the first noumenal basis of the second triangle in the manifested world, have ever been an insuperable obstacle to the theological flights into dogmatic empyreans. On the authority of the archaic symbol, a male personal God, the creator and father of all, becomes a third rate emanation, the Sifaroth, standing forth in descent. And on the left hand of the Esof, the Kabbalistic tree of life, hence the monad is degraded into a vehicle, a throne. The monad, only the emanation and reflection of the point logos in the phenomenal world becomes, as the apex of the manifested equilateral triangle, the father, the left side or the line in the duad, the mother, regarded as evil, counteracting principle, Plutarch, de Platis, Placitorium. The right side represents the son, his mother's husband, in every cosmogony, as one with the apex. At the baseline is the universal plane and productive nature unifying on the phenomenal plane father mother son as these were unified in the apex in the super sensuous world by mystic transmutation they become the quantitary the triangle became the te tetrarch tetra tis i want to say tetrarch because that's what upstairs is giving me so i do apologize i'm again flowing and crazy so i'm gonna pause my fifth dimensional self is like peeking in like myself now this vehicle is peering into fifth dimension i'm like on the cusp and Like reading this is becoming more difficult because this is a third and fourth dimensional concepts. God's source is androgynous. There is no father, mother. It is one that divides into a male or a female aspect in lower densities. But the overall arcing, it's energy and there's a positive and negative pull, but that's only being played out in third density. We're moving into fifth dimension. We're already on fourth density. It's speculative if what you, I mean, and everybody's in different spots vibratorily. 
I still think this is very important to read. It's just my brain is going wonky wonk. So I do apologize. This transcendental application of geometry to cosmic and divine theogony, the alpha and the omega of meta mystical conception, became dwarfed after Pythagoras by Aristotle. By omitting the point in the circle and taking no account of the apex, he reduced the metaphysical value of the idea, and this limited the doctrine of magnitude to a simple triad, the line, the surface, and the body. His modern heirs who play an idealism have interpreted these three geometrical figures as space, force, and matter, the potencies of an interacting unity. Materialistic science perceiving but the basic line of the manifested triangle, the plane of matter, translates its particularly as father matter, mother matter, and son matter, and theoretically as matter force and correlation. But the ad average physicists, as remarkable as they are, remarked by Kvalis, space, force, matter, are what signs in algebra are to the mathematician merely conventional symbols, or force as force and matter as matter, are as absolutely unknowable as is the assumed empty space in which they are held to interact. As symbols representing abstractions, the physicist bases reasoned hypotheses of the, or, the origin of things and sees three needs in what he terms creation, a place wherein to create, a medium by which to create, a material from which to create. And in giving a logical expression to these hypotheses through this term space force matter, he believes he has proved the existence of what, which seems of the represents of as he conceives it to be. The physicists who regard space merely as representation of our mind or extension are related to things in it, which Locke defined as capable of neither resistance nor motion. The paradoxical materialist who would have a void there were he can see no matter would reject with the utmost contempt the proposition that space is a substantial, though apparently as absolutely unknowable living entity. I, I feel that way. Such is nevertheless the Kabbalistic teaching, and it is that of the archaic philosophy. Space is the real world, while our world is an artificial one. It is the one unity throughout its infinitude, in its bottomless depths, as on its elusive surface, a, subs a surface studded with countless phenomenal universes, systems, and mirage-like worlds. Nevertheless, to the Eastern occultist, who is an objective idealist at the bottom in the real world, which is a unity of forces, there is a connection of all matter in the pl plenum as, as Leibniz would say. This is symbolized in the Pythagorean triangle. My perspective, opinion, my alignment goes with we are in a hologram because we are light and light's being projected and we make up that hologram. It's not a bad one, unless you make it that way. It consists of 10 points inscribed pyramid-like from one to the last four. Within its three lines, and it symbolizes the universe in the famous Pythagorean decad. The upper single dot is a monad and represents the unit point, which is the unity from whence all proceeds, and all is of the same essence with it. While the 10 dots within the triangle represent the phenomenal world, the three sides of the equilateral triangle, which encloses the pyramid of dots, are the barriers of noumenal matter and substance that separate it from the world of thought. Pythagoras considered a point to correspond in proportion to unity 
uh, line to two, uh, super superficies to three, a solid to four, and he defined a point as a monad having position and beginning of all things, a line was thought to correspond with duality because it was produced by the first motion from individual, from indivisible nature and formed the junction of two points. A supersees was compared to the number three because in the first of all causes there are found in figures for a circle which is the principle of all round figures, comprises a triad in center space circumference, but a triangle, which is the first of all rectilineal figures is included in a tenerary and receives its form according to that number and was considered by the Pythagoreans to be the creator of all sublunary things. The four points at the base of the Pythagorean triangle correspond with the solid or cube, which combines the principles of length, breadth, and thickness, for no solid can have less than four extreme boundary points. It is argued that the human mind cannot conceive an indivisible unit short of an annihilation of the idea with its subject. This is an error, as the Pythagoreans have proved and a number of seers before them although there is a special training for it, and although the profane mind can hardly grasp it, but there are such things as meta-mathematics -mathematic and meta-geometry. Even mathematics, pure and simple, proceed from the universal to the particular, from the mathematical, hence indivisible point, to solid figures. The teaching originated in India and was taught in Europe by Pythagoras, who throwing a veil over the circle and the point, which no living man can define except as incomprehensible abstractions, laid the origin of the differentiated cosmic matter in the basic or horizontal line of the triangle. Thus, the latter became the earliest of geometrical figures the author of new aspects of life and the Kabbalistic mysteries, objects to the objectivization, so to speak, of the Pythagorean concept and use of the equilateral triangle and calls it a misnomer. His argument that a solid equilateral body, one whose base and each of its sides form equal triangles, must have four co-equal sides or surfaces, which a triangular plane will as necessarily possess five demonstration. Demonstrates on the contrary, the grandeur of the conception in all its esoteric application to the idea that pre-Genesis and Genesis of cosmos. Granted that an ideal triangle depicted by mathematical imagery lines can have no sides at all, being simply a phantom of the mind if sides be imputed to which they must be the sides of the object it constructively represents. But in such case, most of the scientific hypotheses are no better than phantom of the mind. They are unverifiable except an in inference and have been adopted merely to answer scientific necessities. Furthermore, the ideal triangle as the abstract idea of triangular body and therefore as the type of the abstract idea accomplished and carried out to perfection the double symbolism intended as an emblem applicable to the objective idea, the simple triangle became a solid. When repeated in the stone or the four cardinal points, it assumed the shape of a pyramid the symbol of the phenomenal merging into the nominal universe of thought at the apex of the four triangles and as an imaginary figure constructed of three mathematical lines, it symbolized the subjective spheres, those lines enclosing a mathematical space, which is equal to nothing enclosing nothing because to the senses and the untrained consciousness of profane and scientists, 
everything beyond the line of differentiated matter outside of and beyond the realm of even the most spiritual substance has to remain forever equal to nothing. It is the aeon sof, the no thing, yet these phantoms of the mind are in truth no greater abstractions than the abstract ideas in general upon evolution and physical development. Gravity, matter, force, on which the exact science are based. Our most eminent chemists and physicists are earnestly pursuing not hopeless attempt of finally tracing its hiding place in the protile or the basic line of the Pythagorean triangle. The latter is, as said, the grandest conception imaginable as it symbolizes both the ideal and the visible universes. For if the possible unit is only a possibility as an actuality of nature, as an individual of any kind, and as every individual natural object is capable of division and by division loses its unity or ceases to be a unit, it is also only in the realm of exact sciences in a world as deceptive as it is elusive. In the realm of the esoteric sciences, the unit divided ad infinitum, instead of losing its unity, approaches with every division the planes of the only eternal reality. The eye of the seer can follow and behold it in all its pregenic glory. The same idea of the reality of the subjective and the unreality of the objective universes is found at the bottom of the Pythagorean and Platonic teachings limited to the elect alone. For, for Porphyry, so saying that name wrong, speaking of the monad and the duad says that the former only was considered substantial and real. That most simple being the cause of all unity and the measure of all things. But the duad, although the origin of evil or matter, thence unreal in philosophy is still substance during Manvarata and is often called the third monad in occultism and connecting line as between two points or numbers which proceed from that, which was before all numbers as expressed by Rabbi Barahel. And from this duad proceeded all the scintillas of the three upper and the four lower worlds or planes, which are in constant interaction and correspondence. This is a teaching from which the Kabbalah has in common with Eastern occultism. For in the occult philosophy, there are the one cause and the primal cause which later thus becomes paradoxically the second, as clearly expressed by the author of the Kabbalah from the philosophical writings of Ian Grebel. In the treatment of the primal cause, two things must be considered, the primal cause per se and the relation and connection of the primal cause with the visible and unseen universe. Thus, he shows the early Hebrews following in the steps of the Oriental philosophy, Chaldean, Persian, Hindu, Arabic. Their primal cause was designated at first by the triadic Shaddai, the triune, almighty subsequently by the tetragrammaton, symbol of the past, present, and future. And let us add for the eternal eyes or the I am. Moreover, in the Kabbalah, the name Jehovah, expressed as he and she, male and female, two and one, or Hukma and Bina and his, or rather their Shinkna, or synthesizing spirit grace, which makes again of the duad and triad. This is demonstrated in the Jewish liguri from Pentecost and the prayer in the name of unity of the holy and blessed, he and his shinkna, the hidden and concealed hue, Bes blessed be Jehovah, the quintentary forever. He is said to be the masculine and high feminine, 
together they make the yod hey bad hey one but of male female nature the shnikta is always considered in the kabbalah as feminine and so it is considered in the exoteric Puranas, for Shnikta is more than Sakti, the female double or lying of any god in such case. And so it was with the early Christians whose Holy Spirit was feminine, as Sophia was with the Gnostics. But in the transcendental Chaldean Kabbalah, or Book of Numbers, Shnikta is sexless and the purest abstraction a state like nirvana, no, not subject or object or anything except an absolute presence. That was what I was talking about before when I said things are androgynous. So male and female are fused and bind together in one. But they make this more complicated than it needs to be. Thus, it is only the emperor anthropomorphized systems much as the kabbalah has now greatly become the shinkna skati is female as such the as she becomes the duad of pythagoras the two straight lines of the symbol that can never meet which therefore form no geometrical figure and are the symbol of matter out of the duad when united in one basic line of the triangle on the lower plane, the upper triangle of the Sitharothal tree emerged the Elohim or deity in the cosmic nature. With the true Kabbalist, the lowest designation translated in the Bible, God. Out of these issue the Sinctillas. The Sinctillas are the souls, and these souls appear in the threefold form of monads, units, atoms, and gods, according to our teaching. Every atom becomes a visible complex unit, a molecule, and once attracted into the sphere of a terrestrial activity, the monadic essence passing through the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms becomes man. Again, God, monad, and atom are the correspondences of spirit, mind, and body. Atma, ma, Manas, and Sithla in man. In their sedentary aggregation, they are the heavenly man. Thus, terrestrial man is the provisional reflections of the heavenly. The monads are the souls of the atoms. Both are the fabric in which the Kohans cloth themselves when a form is needed. This relates to cosmic and subplanetary monads, not the supercosmic monas, the Pythagorean monad, as called in the synthetic character by the pantheistical precipitates. Precipitates. Pre ah! <laughs> I can't. Yeah, that's not coming out right. <laughs> the monads of the present presentation are treated from the standpoint of their individuality as atomic souls before these atoms descend into pure terrestrial form. For the descendant into concrete matter marks the mid middle point of their own individual pilgrimage. Here, losing in the mineral kingdom their individuality, they begin to ascend through the seven states of terrestrial evolution to the point where a correspondence is firmly established between the human and the Deva, divine consciousness. At present, however, we are not concerned with their terrestrial metamorphosis and tribulations, but with their life and behavior in space on planes where in the eye of the most intuitional chemists and physicists cannot reach them unless indeed he develops in himself highly clairvoyant faculties. It is well known that Leibniz came severally, several times very near the truth, but defined monadic evolution incorrectly, which is not to be wondered at since he was not an initiate, nor even a mystic, only a very intuitional philosopher, yet no psychophysicist can ever come nearer 
than he was to the esoteric general outline of evolution. This evolution viewed from its several standpoints as a universal and the individualized monad and the chief aspects of the evolving energy after differentiation, the purely spiritual and intellectual, the psychic and the physical may thus formulated as an invariable law, a descendant of spirit into matter equivalent to an ascent in physical evolution, a reascent from depths of materiality toward its status quo, ante with a corresponding dis dissipation of concrete form and substance up the Laya state or what science calls the zero point and beyond. These states, once the spirit of esoteric philosophy is grasped, became absolutely necessary from simple logical and, and analogical considerations. Physical science having now ascertained through its departments of chemistry, the invariable law of the evolution of atoms from their prototyan state down to that of the physical and that of a chemical particle or molecule cannot well reject the same as a general law. And once it is forced by its enemies, metaphysics and psychology, and out of its alleged impregnable strongholds, it will find it more difficult now than it now appears to refuse room in the space of space and planetary spirits, gods, elementals, and even the elementary spooks of or ghosts and others. Already figure and Paul D'Assier, two positivists and materialists, has to come before the logical necessity. Other and still greater scientists will follow in that evolution intellectual fall sorry guys my brain it's not functioning properly they will be driven out of their position not by spiritual theosophical or any other physical or even mental phenomena but simply by the enormous gaps and chasms that open daily and still be opening before them as one discovery follows the other until they are finally knocked off their feet by the ninth wave of simple common sense. Here is an example proof. Professor W. Crook's latest discovery of what he has named protile in the notes on the Baha Gita by one of the best metaphysicians and Benedict scholars in India, the lecturer referring cautiously to things occult in that great Indian esoteric work makes a remark as suggestive as it is strictly correct. Into the details of the evolution of the solar system itself, he says, it is not necessary for me to enter. You may gather some idea as the way in which the various elements start into existence from three principles into which multiprakti is differentiated, the Pythagorean triangle, by examining the lecture delivered by Professor Crooks a short time ago upon the so-called elements of modern chemistry, this lecture will give you some idea of the way in which these elements spring from Bruishwana. The most objective of these three principles, which seems to stand in the place of the protile mentioned in the lecture. Except in a few particulars, this lecture seems to give the outlines of the theory of physical evolution on the plane of Vishwar, Vishwanar, whatever that is. And so far as I know, the nearest approach made by modern investigators to the real occult theory on the subject. We all know I can't do any kind of Indian language. Sorry to those friends out there. My brain can't even, can't even function right now. These words will be re-echoed and approved by every Eastern occultist. Much from the lectures by Professor Crooks have already been quoted in the addenda. Since then, there has been another lecture delivered as, remarked, as remarkable as the first one on the genesis of elements, and also a third one 
Here, we have almost a collaboration of the teachings of esoteric philosophy concerning the mode of primeval evolution. It is indeed as near as an approach made by a great scholar and specialist in chemistry to the secret doctrine as could be made apart from the application of the monads and atoms to the dogmas of pure transcendental metaphysics and their connection and correlation with the gods and intelligent conscious monads. But chemistry is now on its ascending plane, thanks to one of the highest European representatives. It is impossible for it to go back to the day when materialism regarded its sub-elements as absolutely simple and homogeneous bodies, which it had raised in its blindness to the rank of elements. The mask has been snatched off by too clever a hand for there to be any fear of a new dis a new dis disguise. And after years of pseudology of bastard molecules parading are under the name of elements behind and beyond which there could be naught but a void, a great professor of chemistry asks once more, what are these elements? Whence do they come? What is their signification? These elements perplex us in our researches, baffle us in our speculations, and haunt us in our very dreams. They stretch like an unknown sea before us, mocking, mystifying, and murmuring strange revelations and possibilities. Those who are heirs to the primeval revelations have taught these possibilities in every century, but have never found the fair hearing. The truth is inspired by Kepler, Leibniz, Gassendi, Swedenborg, wherever a lot alloyed with their own speculations in one or another predetermined direction hence distorted but now one of the great truths has dawned upon an eminent professor of modern exact science and he fearlessly proclaims as a fundamental axiom that science has not made itself acquainted so far the real simple elements for professor crooks tells his audience quote if I venture to say that our commonly received elements are not simple and primordial, that they have not arisen by chance or have not been created in a dislutory and mechanical manner, but have been evolved from simpler matters, or perhaps indeed from one sole kind of matter, I do but give formal utterance to an idea, which has been, so to speak, for some time in the air of science. Chemists, physicists, philosophers of the highest merit declare explicably their belief that the 70 or thereabout elements of our textbooks are not the pillars of Hercules, which we must never hope to pass. Philosophers in the present, as in the past, men who certainly have not worked in the laboratory have reached the same view from another side. Thus, Mr. Herbert Spencer records his conviction that the chemical atoms are produced from the true or physical atoms by process of evolution under conditions which chemistry has not yet been able to produce. And the poet has forestalled the philosopher Milton, Paradise Lost, Book 5, makes the archangel Raphael say to Adam, instinct with the evolutionary idea that the Almighty had created one first matter, all endued with various forms, various degrees of substance. End quote. Nevertheless, the idea would have remained crystallized in the air of science and never have descended into the thick atmosphere of materialism and profane mortals for years to come, perhaps, had not Professor Crooks bravely and fearlessly reduced it to simple elements and thus publicly forced it on scientific notice. An idea, says Plutarch, is a being incorporeal, which has no substance by itself, but gives figure and form unto shapeless matter, the becomings, the cause of manifestation, 
the revolution produced in the old chemistry by Avogadro uh, was the first page in the volume of the new chemistry. Mr. Crooks has now turned the second page and is boldly pointing to what may be the last for once protyl accepted and recognized as invisible ether was both beginning logical and scientific necessities, chemistry will have virtually ceased to live. It will reappear in its reincarnation in the new alchemy or metachemistry. The discoverer of radiant matter will have vindicated in time the archaic Aryan works of occultism and even the Vedas and Puranas. For what are the manifested mother, the father, son, husband? and the sun, the three firstborn, but simply hydrogen, oxygen, and that which is its terrestrial manifestation is called nitrogen. Even the exoteric descriptions of the firstborn triad give all the characteristics of these three gases. Priestly, the discoverer of oxygen or that which was known in the highest antiquity. Yet all the ancient medieval and modern poets and philosophers have been anticipated, even in the exoteric Hindu books, Descartes, plenum of matter differentiated into particles, Leibniz, ethereal fluid, and Kant's primitive fluid, dissolved into its elements, Kepler's solar vortex and systematic vortices, in short, from the elemental vortices in augmented by the universal mind through an exoras down to the Galileo, Torselli, and Swedenborg, and after them to the latest speculations by European mystics, and all this is found in the Hindu hymns and mantras to the gods, monads, and atoms in their fullness, for they are inseparable. In esoteric teachings, the most transcendental conceptions of the universe and its mysteries, as the most seemingly materialistic speculations are found reconciled because those sciences embrace the whole scope of evolution from spirit to matter. As declared by the American the theosophicists, the monads of Leibniz may from one point of view be called force from another matter. To occult science, force and matter are only two sides of the same substance. Let the reader remember these monads of Leibniz, every one of which is a living mirror of the universe, every monad reflecting every other, and compare this view and definition with the certain Sanskrit stanzas translated by Sir William Jones, in which it is said, that the creative source of the divine mind hidden in a veil of thick darkness formed mirrors of the atoms of the world and cast reflection from its own face on every atom. When therefore Professor Crooks declares that if we can show how the so-called chemical elements might have been generated, we shall be able to fill up a formidable gap in our knowledge of the universe. The answer is ready. The theoretical knowledge is contained in the esoteric meaning of every Hindu cosmogony in the Puranas. The practical demonstration thereof is in the hands of those who will not be recognized in this century, save by the very few the scientific probabilities and possibilities of the various discoveries that must inexactably led exact science into the exception of Eastern occult views, which contain all the requisite material for the filling of those gaps are so far at the mercy of modern materialism. It is only by working in the direction taken by Professor Crooks that there is any hope for the recognition of a of a few here to occult truths. Meanwhile, one thirsting to have a glimpse of a practical diagram of the evolution of primordial matter, which separating and differentiating under the impulse of cyclic law divides itself into a sedimentary graduation of substance from a general view, can do no better than the examine the plates attached to Mr. Crook's lecture 
genesis of the elements and the ponder well over some passages of the text. In one place, he says, quote, our notions of a chemical element have expanded. Here too, the molecules have been regarded as an, as an aggregate of two or more atoms and no account has been taken of the architectural design on which these atoms have been joined. We may consider that the structure of a chemical element is more complicated than has hereto been supposed. Between the molecule we are accustomed to deal with in chemical reactions and ultimate atoms at first created some smaller molecules or aggregates of physical atoms, then sub-molecules differ from one the other according to the position they occupy in the yetum edifice. Perhaps this hypothesis can be simplified if we imagine deuterium to be represented by a five shilling piece. By chemical frax fractionation, I have divided it into five separate shillings and find that these shillings are not counterparts, but like the carbon atoms in the benzol ring, have the impress of their position, one, two, three, four, five, stamped on them. If I throw my shilling into the melting pot or dissolve them chemically, the mint stamp disappears and they all turn out to be silver. End quote. This will be the case with all the atoms and molecules when they have separated from their compound forms and bodies, when priolia sets in. Reverse the case and imagine the dawn of a new manbarata, the pure silver of the absorbed material will once more separate into substance, which will generate divine essence, whose principles are the primary elements, the sub-elements, the physical energies and subjective and objective matter, or as these are epitomized gods, monads, and atoms. If leaving for one moment the metaphysical or transcendental side of the question, Dropping out of the present consideration, the supersensuous and intelligent beings and entities believe in by the Kabbalists and Christians, we turn to the atomical theory of evolution. The occult teachings are still found collaborated by exact science and its confessions, as far at least as regards the supposed simple elements now suddenly degraded into poor and distant relatives not even second cousins to the latter. For we are told by Professor Crooks that, quote, here too, it has been considered that if the atomic weight of a metal determined by different observers, setting out from different compounds was always found to be constant, then such metal must rightly take rank among the simple or elementary bodies. We learn that there is no longer the case Again, we have here wheels within wheels. Glad gadolinium is not an element, but a compound. We have shown that yttrium is a complex of five or more new constituents. And who shall venture to gainsay that each of these constituents, if attacked in some different manner, and if the result were submitted to a test more delicate and searching than the radiant matter test, might not be still further div divisible. Where then is the actual ultimate element? As we advance, it recedes like the tantalizing mirage, lakes and groves seen by the tired and thirsty traveler in the desert. Are we in our quest for truth to be thus diluted and bulked? The very idea of an element or something absolutely primary and ultimate seems to be growing less and less distinct. On page 429 of Isis Unveiled, Volume 1, we say that the mystery of first creation, which was ever the despair of science, is unfathomable unless they, the scientists, accept the doctrine of Hermes. They will have to follow the footsteps of the Hermeticists. Our prophecy begins to assert itself. Very interesting there. But between Hermes and Huxley, there is a middle course and a point. 
let the men of science only throw a bridge halfway and think seriously over the theories of Leibniz. We have shown our theories with regard to atomic evolution and their last formation into compound mole chemical molecules being produced within our terrestrial workshops in the Earth's atmosphere and not elsewhere. A strangely, strangely agreeing with the evolution of atoms shown on Mr. Crook's plate several times already, it was stated in the volume that the sun had evolved and aggregated together with his smaller seven brothers from his mother bosom. The bosom be prima materia, the lecture is primordial prototype. Esoteric doctor and see the existence of an antecedent form of energy having periodic cycles of ebb and swell, rest and activity. And behold, a great scholar in science now asking the world to accept this as one of the postulates. We have shown the mother fiery and hot, becoming gradually cool and radiant, and that some scientists claim as his second postulate a scientific necessity, it would seem an eternal action akin to cooling operating solely in the protile. Occult science teaches that the mother lies stretched in infinity during Prilaya, as the great deep, the dry waters of space, according to the quaint expression in the catechism, and because wet only after the separation and the moving of the fit, uh, moving over its face of Narayana, the spirit which is invisible, flame which never burns, but sets on fire all that it touches and gives it life and generation. And now science tells us that the firstborn element most nearly allied with protile would be hydrogen, which for some time would be the only existing form of matter in the universe. What says old science? It answers just so. But we would call hydrogen and oxygen, which instills the fire of life into the mother by incubation in the pregenetic and even pre-geological ages, the spirit, the nominum of that which becomes in its grossest form, oxygen and hydrogen and nitrogen on earth. Nitrogen being of no divine origin, but merely an earth-born cement to unite other gases and fluids and serve as a sponge to carry in itself the breath of life, pure air. Before these gases and fluids become what they are in our atmosphere, they are interstellar ether. Still earlier on a deeper plane, something else and so on in infinitum. The eminent and learned gentleman must pardon an occultist for quoting him at such length, but such is the penalty of a fellow of the Royal Society who approaches so near the precincts of the sacred iditum of occult mysteries as virtually to overstep the forbidden boundaries. But it is time to leave modern physical science and turn to the psychological and metaphysical side of the question. We would only remark that to the two very reasonable postulates required by the eminent lecturer to get a glimpse of some few of the secrets so darkly hidden behind the door of the unknown, a third should be added, less no battering, that it should avail the postulate that Leibniz in his speculation stood on a firm groundwork of fact and truth. The admirable and thoughtful synopsis of those speculations are given by John Theodore Mertz in his Leibniz shows how nearly he was brushed the hidden secrets of esoteric the theogony in his monadologue don't know how to say the end part of that word and yet the philosopher has hardly risen in his speculations above the first planes and lower principles of the cosmic great body his theory soars to no loftier heights than those of the manifested life self-consciousness and intelligence leaving the regions of the earliest post-genetic mysteries untouched as his ethereal fluid is post-planetary but the third postulate will hardly be accepted by the modern man of science, and like Descartes, they will prefer keeping to the properties of eternal things 
which like extension are incapable of explaining the phenomenon of motion rather than accept the latter as an independent force. They will never become anti-Cartesian in this generation, nor will they admit that this property of inertia is not a purely geometrical property, that it points to an existence of something in eternal bodies, which is not extension merely. This is Levna's idea of analysis by Mertz, who adds that he called that something force and maintain eternal things were endowed with force and that in order to be the bearers of this force, they must have a substance for they are not lifeless and inert masses for the centers and bearers of form, a, pu a purely esoteric claim since force was with Leibniz an active principle, the division between mind and matter disappearing by the conclusion, but the mathematical and dynamical inquiries of Leibniz would not have led to the same result in the mind of purely scientific inquirer, but Leibniz was not a scientific man in the modern sense of the word. Had he been so, he might have worked out the conception of energy, defined mathematically the ideas of force and mechanical work, and arrived at the conclusion that even for purely scientific purposes, it is desirable to look upon force not as a primary quantity, but a quantity derived from some other value. But luckily for truth, Leibniz was a philosopher, and as such, he had certain primary principles which biased him in favor of certain conclusions and his discovery that external things were substances endowed with force was at once for the purpose of applying these principles. One of these principles was the law of continuity. Continuity. The conviction that all the world was connected, that there were no gaps and chasms which could not be abridged over. The contrast and extended thinking of substance was unbearable to him. The definition of the extended substances had already been unattainable. It was natural that a similar inquiry was made into the definition of mind, the thinking substance. The divisions made by Leibniz, however incomplete in faculty from the standpoint of occultism, show a spirit of metaphysical intuition to which no man of science, not Descartes, not even Kant, has ever reached. With him, there existed ever an infinite graduation of thought. Only a small portion of the contents of our thoughts, he said, rises into the clearness of, appreci of appreciation into the light of perfect consciousness. Many remain in a confused or obscure state in the state of perceptions, but they are there. Descartes denied soul to the animal. Leibniz endowed, as the occultists do, the whole creation was mental life. This being, according to him, capable of infinite graduations. And this, as Mertz justly observes at once, widened the realm of mental life, destroying the contrast of animate, animate and inanimate matter. It did yet more. It reached, sorry guys, it reacted on the conception of matter of the extended substance. For it became evident that the eternal and material things presented the property of extension to our senses only, not to our thinking faculties. The mathematician, in order to calculate geometrical figures, had been obliged to divide them into an infinite number of infinity, small parts, and the physicist saw no limit to the diversibility of matter into atoms. The bulk through which eternal things seem to fill space was a property which they acquired only through the coarseness of our senses. Leibniz followed these arguments to some extent, but he could not rest content in assuming that the matter was composed of a finite number of very small parts. His mathematical mind forced him to carry out the argument in infinitum. What became of the atom then? They lost their extension and they retain only their property of resistance. They were the centers of force. They were reduced to mathematical points 
But if their extension in space was nothing, so much fuller was their inner life. Assuming that inner existence, such as that of the human mind, is a, is a new dimension, not a geometrical, but a metaphysical dimension, having reduced the geometrical extension of atoms to nothing, Leibniz endowed them with an infinite extension in the direction of their metaphysical dimension. After having lost sight of them in the world of space, the mind has as it were, to dive into a metaphysical world to find and grasp the real essence of what appears in space, merely as a mathematical point. As a cone stands on its point, or a perpendicular straight line cuts a horizontal plane only in one mathematical point, but may extend indefinitely in height and depth, so the essence of things real have only a punctual existence in this physical world of space, but have an infinite depth of inner life in a metaphysical world of thought. This is the spirit, the very root of occult doctrine and thought, the spirit matter and matter spirit extended indefinitely in depth and like the essence of things of Leibniz, our essence of things real is at the seventh depth, while the unreal and gross matter of science and the eternal world is at the lowest end of our perceptive senses. The occultist knows the worth or worthlessness of the latter. The student must now be shown the fundamental distinction between the system of Leibniz and that of occult philosophy of the question of the monads, and this may be done with the monology before us. It may be correctly stated that were Leibniz and Spinoza's systems reconciled, the essence of spirit of esoteric philosophy would be made to appear. From the shock of the two, as opposed to this Cartesian system, emerged the truths of the archaic doctrine. Both oppose the metaphysics of Descartes. I actually do too. His ideas of the contrast of two substances, extension and thought radically differing from each other and mutually irreducible was too arbitrary and too unphilosophical for them. Thus Leibniz made of the two Cartesian substances two attributes of the one universal unity in which he saw God. Spinoza recognized but one universal indivisible substance and absolute all like the power of Brahma Leibniz, on the contrary, perceived the existence of a plurality of substances. There was but one for Spinoza, but for Leibniz, an infinitude of beings from and in the one. Hence, though both admitted both one reality entity, while Spinoza made it impersonal and indivisible, Leibniz divided his personal deity into a number of divine and semi-divine beings. Spinoza was a subjective, Leibniz an objective, pantheist, yet both were great philosophers in their own intuitive perceptions. Now, if these two teachings were blended together and each corrected by the other, and foremost of all the one reality weeded of its personality, they would remain as a sum total, a true spirit of esoteric philosophy in them. The impersonal attributes, absolute divine essence, which is no being, but the root of all being, draw a deep line in your thought between that ever incognizable essence and as invisible yet comprehensible presence, Mokta Prakti or Shnikta, from beyond and through which vibrates the sound of the verbum and from which evolve the numerous hierarchies of intellectual intelligent egos of consciousness as of semi-conscious perceive and ap appreciative beings whose essence in spiritual force whose substance is the elements and whose bodies when needed are the atoms and our doctrine is there for says Leibniz the primitive element of every material body being force which has none of the characteristics of objective matter, it can be conceived, but can never be the object of any imaginative representation. 
that which was for him the primordial and ultimate element in everybody and object was thus not the material atoms or molecules necessarily more or less extended as those of Epicurus and Gassendi, but of Mertz shows immaterial and metaphysical atoms, mathematical points, or real souls, as explained by Henry Black, Black, Blacklier, his French biographer, that which exists outside of us is an absolute manner, our souls whose essence is force. Thus reality in the manifesto world is composed of a unity of units, so to say, immaterial, from our standpoint, and infinite. This Leibniz calls monad, Eastern philosophy, Vivas? The occultism gives it with the Kabbalists and the Christians a variety of names. They are with us as Leibniz, the expression of the universe in every physical point is but the phenomenal expression of the nominal metaphysical point. His distinction between perception and apperception is a philo philosophical, though dim expression of the esoteric teachings. His reduced universes, of which there are as many as there are monads, is the chaotic representation of our sympathetic system with its divisions and subdivisions. As to the relation his monads bear to our Dihan Kohans, cosmic spirits, devas, and elementals, we may reproduce briefly the opinion of a learned and thoughtful theosophicist, Mr. H. A. Holy crap, there's no way I'm pronouncing that properly. Burgrad. It's like this big, I, I'm sorry, on the subject in an excellent paper on the elementals, the elementary spirits and the relationship between them and human beings read by him before the Aryan Theosophical Society of New York. That guy, I'm just, I'm going to just skip that name, sorry, formulates distinctly his opinion to Spinoza's substance is dead and inactive, but to Leibniz, Penetrating mind, everything is living, active activity, and active energy. In holding this view, he comes indefinitely nearer the Orient than any other thinker of his day or after him. His discovery that an active energy forms the essence of substance is a principle that places him in direct relationship to the seers of the East. And the lecturer proceeds to show that in Leibniz's atoms and elements are centers of force, or rather spiritual beings, whose very nature is to act, for the elementary particles are not acting mechanically, but from an inertial, internal principle. They are incorporeal spiritual units, substantial, however, but not immaterial in our sense, inaccess inaccessible to all changes from without, and indestructible by any external force. Leibniz's monads adds the lecturer differ from Adams in the following particulars, which are very important for us to remember. Otherwise, we shall not be able to see the difference between elementals and mere matter. Atoms are not distinguished from each other. They are qualitatively alike, but one monad difference from every other monad qualitatively and every one is a peculiar world to itself not so with atoms they are absolutely alike quali quantitatively and qualitatively and possess no individuality of their own again the atoms and molecules while well, this keeps going and going rather of materialistic philosophy can be considered an extended and divisible while the monads are mere mathematical points and indivisible, finally, and this is a point where these monads of Leibniz closely resemble the elementals of mystic philosophy, these monads are representative beings. Every monad reflects every other. Every monad is a living mirror of the universe within its own sphere. And 
mark this for upon it depends the power possessed by these monads and upon this depends the work they can do for us in mirroring the world the monads are not mere passive reflective agents but spontaneously self-active they produce the images spontaneously as the soul does a dream in every monad therefore the adept may read everything even the future Every monad or elemental is a looking glass that can speak. It is at this point that Leibniz's philosophy breaks down. There is no provision made nor any distinction established between the elemental monad and that of a high planetary spirit or even the human monad or soul. He even goes so far as to sometimes doubt whether God has ever made anything but monads or substances without extension. He draws a distinction between monads and atoms because as he repeatedly states, bodies with all their qualities are only phenomenal like the rainbow. But soon after he finds a provision for this in a substantial correspondence, a certain metaphysical bond between the monads, vinculium substantial, esoteric philosophy teaching an objective idealism, though it regards the objective universe and all in it as Maya temporary illusion, draws a practical distinction between collective illusion, ma mahai Maya from the purely metaphysical standpoint and the objective relations in it between various conscious egos, so long as this illusion lasts. The adept, therefore, may read the future in the elemental monad, but he has to draw for this object a great number of them, as each monad represents only a portion of the kingdom it belongs to. It is not in the object, but the modification of the cognition of the object that the monads are limited. They all go confusedly to the infinite, to the all, but they are all limited and distinguished by degrees of distinct perceptions. And as Leibniz explains, all the portions of the universe are distinctly represented in the monads, but some are reflected one monad, some in another. But a number of monads could represent simultaneously the thoughts of the two millions of inhabitants of Paris. But what say the occult, to, occult science to this and what do they add? They say that what is called collectively monads by Leibniz, roughly viewed and leaving every subdivision out of calculation for the present, may be separated into three distinct hosts which counted from the highest planes are firstly gods or conscious spiritual egos, the intelligent architect who work after the plan in the divine mind. Then come the elementals or monads from whom collectively and unconsciously the grand universal mirrors of everything connected with their respective realms. Lastly, the atoms or material molecules which are informed in their turn by their appreciative monads, just as every cell in a human body is so informed. There are shawls of such informed atoms, which in their turn form the molecules, or infinitude of monads, or elementals proper and countless spiritual forces, mod modalis, for they are pure incorporalities, except under certain laws, when they assume a form not necessarily human, whence the substance that clothes them, the apparent organism, they evolve around their centers, the formless radiations existing in the harmony of the universal will and being what we term the collective or the aggregate of cosmic will on the plane of subjective universe unite together an infinitude of monads each the mirror of its own universe and thus individualized by the same, sorry, individualized for the time being an independent mind, omnipresent and universal. And by the same process of magnetic aggregation, they create for themselves objective visible bodies out of interstellar atoms. For atoms and monads associated or disassociated, simple or complex, 
or from the moment of the first differentiation, but the principle, corporal, psychic, and spiritual of the gods, themselves the radiation of primordial nature. Thus, to the eye of the seer, the higher planetary powers appear under two aspects, the subjective as influence and the objective as mystic forms, which under karmic law become a present spirit and matter being one, as representatively and repeatedly stated, spirit is matter on the seventh plane. Matter is spirit on the lowest point of the cyclic activity and both are maya. Atoms are called vibrations in occultism, also sound collectively. This does not interfere with Mr. Tyndall's scientific discovery he traced on the lower rung of the ladder of monadic being the whole course of the atmospheric vibrations, and this constitutes the objective part of the process in nature. He has traced and recorded the rapidity of their motion and transmission, the force of their impact, their setting up vibrations in the tampium, and their transmission of these to the stolith. Stolithes, fucking that word up, till the vibration of the auditory nerve commences and new phenomenon now takes place, the subjective side of the process of the sensation of sound. Does he perceive or see it? No, for his specialty is to discover the behavior of matter. But why should not a psychic see it, a spiritual seer, whose inner eye is open and who can see through the veil of matter. The waves and undulations of science are all produced by atoms propelling their molecules into active activity from within. Atoms fill the immensity of space and by their continuous vibration are that motion which keeps the wheels of life perpetually going. It is the inner work that produces the natural phenomena called the correlation of forces. Only at the origin of every such force, there stands the conscious guiding nominum, there of angel or God, spirit or demon, ruling powers yet the same. As described by the seers, those who can see the motion of the interstellar shoals and follow them in their evolution clairvoyantly, they are dazzling like specks of virgin snow in radiant sunlight. Their velocity is swifter than thought, quicker than any mortal physical eye could follow, and as well as can be judged from the tremendous rapidity of their course, the motion is circular, standing on an open plain, on a mountain summit especially, and gazing into the vast vault. Above and the spatial infinitudes around, the whole atmosphere seems ablaze with them, the air soaked through with these dazzling coruscations. At times, the intensity of their motion produces flashes, like the northern lights during the aurora borealis. The sight is so marvelous that as the seer gazes into this inner world and feels the scintillating points shoot past him, he is filled with awe at the thought of another. Still greater mysteries than lie beyond and within the radiant ocean. However imperfect and incomplete this explanation on gods, monads, and atoms, it is hoped that some students in theosophists are at least will feel that they may be indeed a close relation between materialist, materialistic science and occultism, which is the complement and missing soul of the former. Sorry, guys, that was banana nuts. I got through it. I hope you stayed here to get through it with me. Holy shit. That happens sometimes with Levonsky. It just keeps going and going and going and going and going and going and going. And, going. and then, like, I get tired. My face hurts. My nose gets itchy. But we made it through. Next time, we'll do cyclic evolution and karma. Cycles, karma. Rending all of this, but it's good to know it moving forward. So, guys, I hoped 
you got something out of that. Um, it's basically saying a lot of the things I say about spiritual stuff, but more in a scientifically smarter person way. That's the best I can wrap that up as. Um, I hope each and every one of you has a fantastic rest of your week. Sending each and every one of you as I push my hair in front of my face. Love, light, compassion, grace, protection, and shielding energy. Please be safe, be seen. Go within. And I hope many of you are starting your fifth, upper fourth, fifth dimensional peekaboo it's buggy time again and i got some and i send that soul into the love and light if i killed it i don't think i did i hope all of you have a fantastic rest of your day please be safe Protect your energy fields. And I hope to see you guys on the next one. Bye for now.